Good afternoon and welcome to Planning and Marketing for the Rebound. My name is Dante. I'll be taking you through this one this afternoon. Apologies if you had a bit of uh, trouble getting in. There were some um, mistakes made with the scheduling of the Zoom webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, webinar information. Um, hopefully that's all good now. I can see Catherine's in who was having a little bit of trouble there. So thank you, Catherine, and welcome aboard Ray as well. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a different one because there's a lot of theory in this one rather than how to's but um, given that there's only a few of us on the call this afternoon it might be useful for us to have a bit of a back and forth and sort of open it up for you to participate as well ask a few questions <clears throat> and we can start to build a few little plans around uh, the marketing rebound for your own businesses one-to-one -one. so we can um, probably copy a look, uh, cover some stuff that's a little bit more than what we'd normally be doing so what this is for today is for business owners who tend to manage their own marketing. So they haven't outsourced all their marketing uh, to agencies. Those who do have a marketing budget of some description. So in most cases, your marketing isn't going to come without some kind of cost. So you're talking about the kind of costs that um, would be associated with, uh, well, any kind of advertising really. Uh, Facebook ads uh, could be something to do with uh, Google ads. You might do local radio advertising as well. And those who are willing to test. So there's not really gonna be a lot of immediate results that you're gonna find in here. This is talking about some longer term stuff and some real thinking points when it comes to how to prepare yourself and your business for the next three, six and 12 months. When it comes to the patterns we can see in things like um, consumer behavior or patterns we'll see in the way that the, the marketing platforms will evolve. And a lot of this will come off a lot of observations come as well as some stats that have come from the Australian Marketing Institute and the Interactive Advertising Bureau. I've also pulled a few stats too from Free TV, which is the body that um, covers uh, commercial television and uh, the Commercial Radio Australia, which covers obviously commercial radio. So what we'll cover today is what has changed in marketing as a result of the COVID-19 upsets what consumers will do now that the rebound is beginning and what we're sort of look what the what the trends are telling us is going to happen a little bit further down the track and there were quite a few industries that i was able to get some sort of coverage from then how you sort of start to put in plan a three-step plan for a post-covid recovery when it comes to marketing particularly but we'll look at it at a few different angles. And with um, there's just the four of us in here today, apart from myself. So this will give us a chance to look at very specific ideas and probably give you some advice one-to-one -one on some of the things you can start to plan for with your particular industry. A bit about me, um, if you haven't been in one of my webinars before, um, I'm the only Aussie now with six professional certifications from Facebook, also a trainer with Google's digital literacy program, uh, partner with Shopify, NBN, um, and a couple of government programs such as the ASBAS Digital Solutions, Stay Smart Online, and Be Connected. Marketing-wise, I've worked in radio, television, search, social media. Um, I'm also a certified professional marketer with both the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK, but it is a global uh, thing, and the Australian Marketing Institute more recently. Now, that's something a bit different that you may not know about me. I used to be a GP and a psychiatric registrar, and I have a PhD in clinical psychology that I'm not really using all that much these days. I've certainly moved out of the medical field, but it was um, really interesting how life can change. You, know, you grow up thinking you're going to be a doctor, and then you become a doctor, and then you absolutely hate every second of it. So a little bit of a fun thing here is a quote from Matthew Ingman, who has an online comic called The Oatmeal. Now, if you've come across this before, you'd know his work really well. If not, have a read this. He says to put your energy in the things that are likable, not some douchey social media strategy. And that's quite often what we can get caught up in. And I've done it myself so many times where someone's wanted to be given a social media strategy. And a lot of what goes into a social media strategy is guesswork. It's not based on much data. It's usually based on here's the trends that we think are going to happen, here's what we think people are liking, or here's the you know, stuff that we read from the last white paper that we happened to pick up. Um, the simple thing there is putting your attention on the things that people like when it comes to what you're selling. This guy sells t-shirts and comic books and all that sort of thing. So he knows very well, I guess, that you have to produce things that make sense to people. And this is a bit of the, um, the COVID-19 stuff that he was producing, showing that he wasn't trying to 
put together some great big strategy. He just always works every day in what he produces being about, will people like this? Will this be something they want to share? Will it be likable? And I guess that's a lot of what ha happens with um, a lot of your, your businesses as well. Is it quite often we get into the business because we believe in something because it has a particular attraction to us or it's because of, um, you know, we see an opportunity. But when it comes down to it, a business is only as good as its customers and it's only as powerful as its customers. And if you're trying to do something that people just simply don't want, it's kind of like trying to, you know, flog a dead horse. Um, you have to do a lot of work in the background to introduce a product that people don't know and don't know they don't know. Um, whereas if it's something which you know that people definitely like and it's in an area that people have been proven to have an interest in, then it's so much easier to make that something that people have some likable likability around. And when people like things, they'll share them, they'll talk about them, and you'll find that the sales process is that much easier as well. So some of the things we've learned along the way during COVID-19 that in a crisis, we turn to Facebook and online news, as opposed to turning to the six o'clock news on Channel 9 or the, um, you know, the newspapers so much. We turn to the news sites, they're up by 34% in traffic, according to the Interactive Advertising Bureau. And in Facebook's case, they had a very remarkable increase in the amount of people who are active on their platform in Australia, from 16 million in January to now a steady 18 to 20 million at any one different day. That's a significant amount of additional Australians are on there considering we only have what, 25 million. So that amount of people were active on something to do with Facebook, whether it was in Messenger, they were using it um, to keep in contact with family or whether it was through the Facebook feed where they were using that to get information from local sources that they normally couldn't get hold of through, you know, um, network television and network radio. And in a crisis, advertisers drop marketing. That's what, we, that's what we really noticed that was quite dramatic, that there was a 70% drop in advertising across the board, according to the Australian Institute of Marketing. That is 70% down on this spend on every sector all brought together. 67% of that, um, of, of a drop in Google ads, which was quite remarkable because we thought that online advertising would have not been that as strongly affected, but Google ads absolutely took a battery. And so did social ads, a 42% drop in ads on platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook. If you notice what I may have noticed that I got a lot of rubbish ads coming through to me, things that just didn't seem quite so relevant during COVID-19. Now that's sort of calmed down a bit and I'm getting ads that seem to be a lot more geared towards what my usual likes and interests are. But during COVID-19, particularly in March and April and, and into May as well, I just noticed that the ads that were coming through were absolute rubbish. They just had so little relevance to anything I'd normally be interested in. So how did this then really affect businesses? I'll talk at a particular air conditioning mechanic based in Darwin and his work on Google ads. A couple of years ago, we spent um, around about $500 a month on ads and it didn't really get him very far at all. Didn't get him a lot of work. Um, it just didn't seem to, to react very well. He was up against some really, really solid competition. There were at least 30 competitors that all appeared to have some kind of spend on Google ads. Fast forward to 2020, he's had six times the result, but he ended up spending half as much, $250 a month, and he was booked out for a solid um, three months. So I think his, um, the last time we spoke to him, he was booked out until the end of July. So for a sole trader, that is a really good result. And it meant that he would say, well, I don't need to advertise anymore because I'm booked out for three months, but he's looking at it like this. He said, if I can get that kind of response now, imagine if I keep doing it, I can keep that response coming. My only warning there would be is that in the recovery, we're starting to see a lot of those other air conditioning guys starting to come back on board who stopped doing their advertising. And they're starting to drive the cost per click up in Google ads again. The, uh, the new, online newspaper on Facebook. Um, this is an example of a particular, sorry, Google, I didn't really talk to you then. My phone was just waking up, so I mentioned the G word. Um, there's a new online newspaper in a regional market that I won't discuss because um, they, they do not want to be identified. But they took through a process of boosting some of their lead stories on Facebook at $10 a day. And through that, were able to gain an additional 22,000 
subscribers to their website. Now they don't take payment for subscribers, so they're not paying people. But for their advertisers, that's good. That's really good to see. They've got 22,000 more sets of eyes, 22,000 more email addresses that are able to receive news every single day from this particular online newspaper. So these guys uh, previously uh, didn't do any advertising uh, except for a little bit of stuff on Google where they wanted to get um, people who are generally looking to do advertising locally in their area to come through and look at them as, a, as a, an alternative for advertising. When they spun that around and went, well, what do people like in the news? Stories that really sort of you know, make them angry or stories that make them go, oh. So they, they started doing that, boosting those stories out and they gained an additional 22,000 people because people were looking for news and solid sources of information during COVID-19. Whereas before they might just sort of floated through the Facebook feed and not really taken much notice, but having um, an ad come up with news in it was a really novel way for them to get a bit more coverage than they normally would. And then there's a personal trainer who was in the Gold Coast in Queensland who built an isolation fitness kit. She managed to get email addresses for that. So she had how to build your own and it was a downloadable thing of where to get it and how to get it nice and cheaply and, and how, even how to get the, the different items delivered to you. Um, she, she collected a whole bunch of email addresses, um, discovered that a whole bunch of people didn't necessarily want to have put this kit together themselves and asked her to put the kit together for her. So she sold a couple hundred of these kits with a really, really solid markup. She just went to the local, you know, cheaper sports warehouses, whether it's Rebel or I think our Sporties is one of the ones on the Gold Coast as well, where she was able to get a lot cheaper products and then packaged them up and was able to sell those at a big markup and gained 17 new PT clients out of that process as well. Now that you can exercise outside, particularly in groups, um, that certainly gave her something as well. This is something which normally she said she wouldn't be able to afford to do that kind of advertising, but it got to the point where instead of her having to spend a minimum of something like $700 a month to get herself in the mix of other personal trainers on the Gold Coast, she was able to then spend as little as $350 and get the same kind of reach so that she could go, well, I can put that aside. I can pan that loss. And she ended up making that way back in just selling those kits that she was able to sell and then send out to people who wanted them. So there's a bit of a difference between what we expected during COVID-19 and what we got during COVID-19. We, in the industry, increased ad spend from major corporations is what we expected. Um, we expected they were gonna go, well, we need to drive sales more than ever before. So quickly, keep pushing it through, push it through, get people to continue to buy. We expected a massive move to social media ads from those major corporations, knowing that people were gonna be in front of computers a lot more, being on phones a lot more, and not being able to be distracted by real life so much, that they would be moving so much of that spend into social media ads. And we expected there would be a rush of government advertising on the online platforms that was gonna drive up the cost of ads for you and I. So the more those 15, 20, 25 million you know, $50 million campaigns that get pushed onto a, onto a platform, the less space there is for you and I to spend our, you know, 10 bucks a day that we're going to spend. So yeah, that's all what we we're expecting. The reality was though, that there was a massive reduction in spend by major corporations and those who did make new ads tended to do those whole things of reminding us that they've always been there for us and they, they plan on still being there for us and our families. Those, those feel good ads that are reminding us that there's hope in the world. And uh, some of these ads all started to look the same. I saw a lovely compilation on YouTube the other day, which said, um, why do all these major corporations ads all look the same? And they're all uh, empty streets with a colorful flower in the pavement and people um, smiling through phones, talking to each other. There was a massive drop in online advertising by pretty much everyone. It wasn't just the big corporations who dropped it. It was mum and dad businesses. It was sole traders. It was tradies. It was people like myself in agencies. We dropped our spending by a huge amount. So what it did, because we didn't fill up all that space with the major corporations and everybody was dropping off, suddenly the cost per click on platforms like uh, Google and the cost per thousand, which is one of the metrics you'll get through Facebook ads as well, or CPM they often call it, 
was much, 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 much lower than usual because all of those platforms operate on an auction basis. It's on supply and demand. So the more people who are going for those spaces, the more it's going to cost and the less reach you're going to get. But when they drop right off, you're getting a lot more reach and you're also getting um, a lot less cost for that reach. And the great thing for those of us who did take advantage of that is that we're getting far greater reach of far less cost, but we're also up against far less competitors uh, at a time when so many people were online. We've had, like we've showed before, how gee, even Facebook showed an increase from 15 or 16 million up to 20 million people over a month being on their platform just within Australia. So having that increase of people who are active online meant that there were things that people who were online were looking for if they weren't necessarily looking to shop for luxury items or to, to shop for you know, personal development and coaching services, they were on there shopping for something. So those who had something to sell that was appropriate to the times and appropriate to what the needs of those people were, were definitely able to get their message through really, really clearly. As I saw, I got so many ads for things that I'm just never gonna be interested in, never gonna buy. I was seeing things that were probably not even a good gender match for who I am um, because a lot of the stuff that normally wouldn't make it through the auction were suddenly making it through to me. So I was getting very irrelevant ads, things that just normally would never make it through. Another thing that happened too is that spend that we expected from the government to fill up all those digital marketing spaces. So, you know, all those ad spots on Google and all those ad spots on Facebook ended up being given away. To government in different ways so for instance you would see prompts come up at the top of google instead of ads prompts at the top of facebook instead of ads pointing to what the official excuse me what the official government um the government information and sources would be so the governments didn't have to actually pay for that and it wasn't taking away any ad space and this is a way for i guess the platforms to say we're doing our bit to make sure correct information is getting out there, but also we're doing our bit to ensure that not everyone's getting wiped out by a sudden influx of huge government spending coming in. So that's one of the ways that they said, look, we can take all this money and that'd be great. Or what we can do is we can do something different and say, let's invest in the future of our platform by not flooding our platform full of ads for all the same thing. What we were left with at the end was, yep, was that lower cost per click on Google. In fact, in some industries, like I saw, particularly in the trades, construction, building, plumbing, carpentry, all that, up to a 60% drop in the cost of reaching people um, on Google Ads. So that was a remarkable drop that happened during COVID-19. We also saw a bigger reach on Facebook and Instagram. As I said before, an extra 4 million people is a lot of eyes that are coming in. But when your advertisers have dropped by 42%, there's less people trying to get ads in front of more people who are viewing those ads. So we're in a perfect buyer's market there. And we still are to a degree. There was also greater organic reach on platforms like LinkedIn and Pinterest. Another 20% people came on to LinkedIn particularly, not just looking for work as I've stated there, but also looking for inspiration around work, career change. They may have been stood down for an indeterminate period of time. So they were looking for ways to increase their learning, increase their ability to find the next job, or if they, to fill time or make some extra money as a gig worker of some description, whether that was picking up Uber Eats deliveries driving, or whether it was to do some you know, freelance stuff on the side while they were getting no money from their primary source of income or their primary employer. Which brings us then to what is gonna change for good? So what of all these changes we've seen in consumer behavior, and also in terms of the marketing industry itself and what things won't change. So what is, what is kind of gone and never coming back and what can we expect that will return in some way? One of the most hefty things that was affected was interest in things that are, are, are marked as organic, natural or sustainable. The interest according to AC Nielsen, and this was in Australian um, as well, it was almost like a complete flip between uh, around September last year and May this year. But the interest in things that were organic or marked as natural or had some sort of sustainability focus on it had absolutely crashed. In fact, in their particular survey they ran across Australia in household cleaning products, the lowest ranking priorities were things like sustainable packaging, which was the very last. These are in order of 
of, of how low they were. So stain all package was the very last item. Then organic ingredients made by a company I trust, sustainable ingredients, high quality ingredients, locally made. They were all flipped over from things such as effective in killing germs, um, able to be uh, cheap price, for instance, was, was one of the higher ones as well. The effectiveness at killing germs seemed to be far more of a focus in consumers than some of those things we've become quite used to, which was more sustainable packaging and ingredients, maybe even organic ingredients, uh, things that were made locally, so they were a little bit more attuned to our local environment. Environmental concerns and sustainability and organic, um, sadly, just completely became a non-event to the broader consumer market. In retail and dine-in experiences, AC Nielsen similarly ran another survey in early June, showing that retail shopping, the lowest ranking priorities right now are things like having a beautiful store with friendly staff, the ability to try on clothes, having a great in-store experience and having the ability to dine in. Um, I've seen uh, probably in our local major shopping center here that the food court seems to have plenty of people in it. But what we've found is that it's way lower than the amount of people that used to be in there. They, yeah, there's, there's, you used to not be able to find a seat. Go back three, six months, you couldn't find a seat at all in, on a Saturday for lunch. Now you can wander in on Saturday and there's still plenty of seats available. A lot of people in there, but still there's plenty of seats there. It's nice and easy to find one. But what has happened is that all those things that used to be so important to us that would drag us into a shop front are suddenly not anywhere near as, 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 as valuable. So which has really sort of taken a lot of the, um, the, the prestige brand stores and, and just smashed them about because they are all about the friendly staff, the ability to try before you buy, the great experience when you're walking in the store, the beautiful storefront and the beautiful windows. All those things have become far less important as we've spun around so many of our purchases of things like apparel, homewares, a lot of those, those core things that you see in shopping centers apart from food, they've really spun around to be things that, you know what, I can wait two weeks for that to arrive from Kmart Online. I can wait for that to come from Lush Cosmetics um, for you know a week. I don't mind waiting for all that. So there's been a massive increase in online shopping for those kind of, not everyday items, but let's just say once a month items rather than once a week items. Um, they've gone very, very largely online. What we do expect to return to some degree of normal within the next three months is areas like scheduled shopping. Now, that's where you might be a mum and Saturday morning is when you shop. The kids are all off at footy or ballet or whatever they do on a Saturday that's their extracurricular activities. And you're off to do your, your supermarket shopping on Saturday mornings because that's the only time you get to yourself. That kind of scheduled shopping was really disrupted by the fact that a lot of the parents had to work from home. So the shopping then became a matter of, I get to do it when I get to do it. And I'm not going to overdo it because half the things aren't in the supermarket and I can't get toilet paper. So let's just go at unusual times when I can sort of fit it around the kids of having to be homeschooled or fit it around having to work from home. So you find there was a lot more early morning shopping before school hours or before homeschool hours, before work hours, and a lot more late at night shopping. Kids are in bed, dad can look after them, make sure they don't get up to bad stuff, and you can finally get out and do some shopping on your own and get it done. This scheduling of shopping will return um, where you have a regular routine because everything else is getting back in the regular routine. The kids' sports is back. Kids' activities are back. Um, by and large, most people are now back at working in the office or working in their workplaces again, if they've still got jobs. The idea of coffee culture will return, but not quite the way we saw it. So they returned to buying like a lot of takeaway coffees. Um, and I've noticed this too, just in my local coffee shops, the takeaway coffee thing has really taken off. But the sitting down to enjoy coffee and conversation in a cafe just hasn't quite bounced back to the level that, it, that we kind of expected it would by now. There's in that first week where you're able to do it, yes, there was a, definitely a lot of people coming back in, but that died right back off. It's almost like we've got other things to do now. We've got um, webinars to get onto, we've got work to get to. So the whole lingering around the cafe, having a chat, having a read, getting out the laptop, that kind of thing has really dropped off quite a lot, but the actual volume of people doing takeaway has increased. And the bargain hunting of looking for the cheapest rather than the best 
in a lot of items. So going to things like markets, yard sales, even estate sales is all pretty much returning back to the normal levels that we expect. That doesn't mean that everyone's suddenly going to op shops. It just means that um, the ability to go to places where you will get lower prices for things. So it could be a discount supermarket if those still exist, or it could be a discount um, variety store rather than going to a department store that might be something that gets to you. Or it could mean even that sort of running around looking for cheaper prices on, you know, for instance, going to a fruit and veg market that you know you can get your fruit and veg a lot cheaper for, going to a dedicated meat market to get the cheaper meat rather than just doing everything in the one supermarket. What we expect that won't be returning to normal in the next six months, and a lot of these stats coming from the Australian, Market, Australian Marketing Institute, is the health and wellbeing car, uh, category. Now, we're not talking about medical, we're talking about non-medical. So things like um, the essential oils, massage services, um, products that are you know, uh, supplements, all that kind of thing, has pretty much been smashed about. Uh, with a lot of the attention being taken away from that and onto what we call sort of medical grade stuff. So medical grade wipes on benches, um, making sure that, you know, things like cold and flu tablets rather than um, the organic all natural alternatives. So that sort of thing we've seen is, is really, really crashed out. And that does affect another particularly large industry, which I'll get to very shortly. We look then too at things that are handcrafted and homemade. This is really unfortunate because this is what comes behind a lot of um, a lot of really good uh, moves like buy from the bush, which is a hashtag you can follow on Instagram. Some really good items you can buy from uh, bushfire and drought affected communities across Australia. The cost of these items, their slow delivery, will be a turn off. So that means that um, if I can go and buy an ironing board cover from Kmart, I'm probably more likely to do that than look up um, one that's going to take me two weeks to get. It's going to cost me three times the price just because I want to say it's handcrafted and homemade. Those kind of um, the brag items, we like to call them, uh, are just not going to recover very well in the next six months. They are kind of things that, that rely on a very healthy economy and a very large, um, a large uh, disposable income. So we'll start to see, after six months, we'll start to see that creep back in again as we see the job market start to stabilize as well. But at the moment, um, expect, especially just after September, we're going to see a lot of these things completely crash out as people just cannot afford them because there's so many jobs that are going to be lost once the job keeper payments are lifted. Which brings us then to um, life coaching and things like mindset and mentoring. And I would even put in here things like personal training. These are going to be seen as an unaffordable luxury for some time now. We're expecting to have some of the highest unemployment figures after September that our country has possibly ever seen since the Great Depression of 1928. So we're, we're not expecting that these things, which are all about um, you know, getting ahead and getting an edge and, and getting your mindset worked out, these things, although very important and have formed a very, very big industry um, in the last 10 years, these are the first things that often get dropped. So unfortunately, there's no real good news in that. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to go broke. It just means that there's going to be um, a, a much lower demand, but there's going to be quite an oversupply, particularly when it comes to mindset coaches. And a lot of the programs around that, they're going to really sort of drop the anchor. So how has this also affected the changes in marketing over COVID-19 and what we're expecting to happen over the next few months? We've seen TV and radio advertising absolutely crash and all the industries, um, I know Southern Cross Stereo, who's the largest owner of um, TV and radio stations across Australia, um, have put a lot of uh, profit warnings out to their shareholders to say expect a loss this year because we've had to spend a lot to survive this and we're not expecting to make much money this year. So these are already dropping pretty steadily anyway, those industries, but now we're looking at them just completely crashing out and you probably see, and starting to see things like in the ABC sacking 250 people, removing some channels, not from a lack of, um, of, of of funding through advertising because you don't advertise on those, but more of a fact that there's just not an audience for it. And so it cannot be justified as easily as the main news channels. But then at the same time, you'll start to see um, a lot less attention put on secondary TV channels, digital radio channels, that kind of thing. You're going to start to see uh, local radio announcers in the afternoon will start to be dropped off in favor of networked programming coming through from you know, Melbourne and Sydney. In Google, the uh, 
the cost has already bounced back up as more small businesses are returning onto the, the advertising platform. Google Ads has really been like an amazing uh, microcosm of behavior in COVID-19 because we really did see it at some of its highest ever prices just before COVID-19, then it crashed. And now it's probably about 80% back to where it was, but it's still not quite there. So there's still a chance for you to get in there and get a much better cost per click and a much higher reach out of your Google Ads than what you were getting, say, this time last year. Just um, pop in, Ray just said, um, we sell a brag item, which is homemade jewelry, which isn't available in stores. Given what you say, should we be trying to target those with jobs and money and stress that it is unique? Um, I would say um, in, in terms of who you would be starting to push that towards, I'd be starting to say less about buying things for ourselves and more about buying gifts for those we love. So I'd be, I'd be going for more that gift market because there's still people who still need to buy birthday and Christmas presents. Um, but we're not buying as much luxury items for ourselves. We, we might um, treat ourselves to a coffee and a cake, but treating ourselves to um, a piece of handmade jewelry, maybe not quite so much, but you can push for more of that, that gift market. So going for people, yes, that do have jobs and money, but people who are also looking to buy gifts. I think that's um, a big market for you, I think, because as we start to look at how we can save money, yes, we will try to buy lower priced gifts, and that handmade jewelry actually could be something which is a, a bit lower price than what they were going to buy before. So I think that's um, a yeah, really good opportunity in there to, to narrow down your marketing to something a little less wide of I'm buying it for myself and a little bit more specific to I'm buying this for someone I love. I'm buying this for mum. I'm buying this for my sister. I'm buying this for my brother. I'm buying this for my aunt. So yeah, really good question. Thanks for that, Ray. In Facebook and social, the price has almost rebounded back to normal on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I guess it's because people like me have been sort of telling everyone, you should be advertising now because it's lower price than ever before, so get in there and do it. Um, and LinkedIn is a little lower than it was, but it's still you know, a fair bit higher than the cost of Facebook and Instagram. What you'll start to find is that um, where before you were perhaps um, able to get a little bit of a result out of putting a very broad ad out to a very broad amount of people, on Facebook and most social media platforms now, um, you will start to need to narrow that back down in again. So whilst you've been able to get away with being super broad during COVID-19, you'll need to return that back to a little bit more, excuse me, a little bit more targeting towards a very specific audience and using what we call retargeting, which is um, look at people who've engaged with you before and creating custom audiences in Facebook and lookalike audiences in Facebook so you can much better identify the, the most likely candidates to be interested in what you do and then giving them a few touch points along the way. That's the sort of thing I probably need to bring up in a, um, in a very separate webinar than this to give you sort of how to do that all stuff. And I will be doing, I believe I've got one of those a little bit later in um, mid-July, I think it is. So what will consumers do as we start to rebound? What are their behaviors based on the trends we're seeing and some of the better minds in the Australian Marketing Institute and the Interactive Advertising Bureau and a, and a report I saw come out from Commercial Radio Australia as well, indicate that there will be a slow return to what we call sociality. So in-person social um, situations such as going to shopping centers. We are going to see a rebound in foot traffic. We already are, but they're not buying stuff. We probably won't see much of a rebound in shopping center sales until the pre-Christmas sales. And we're already seeing that just about every store has got like massive discounts on things and stock take sales have kind of become brought forward and everything. Nothing seems to be sold at full price at the moment. So yes, we will see a rebound in people going into shopping centers, but no likely rebound in sales until pre-Christmas. And it's probably going to be one of the lower Christmases we've seen in quite some time. Um, a lot of the, um, the money that was going to be allocated towards shopping for things will be allocated towards interstate travel. So particularly once um, all the borders start to open again, I myself have got a, I've got a flight booked from Darwin to uh, Brisbane on the 2nd of August, because I really miss my family. And I really want to go and see them. So um, you're going to start to see a lot of that. So as um, Jetstar's got a lot of cheaper prices out at the moment, Virgin looks like it's going to survive to see another day and Qantas is going to start ramping back up again. Whilst we can't get overseas, you'll start to see some of that money that would normally be ploughed into things like Christmas ploughed into just going and seeing the people we love who live in other states. Outdoor activities like um, working out in groups uh, with PTs, that are personal trainers, that will increase sharply. 
but we're expecting that to come at the expense of gyms. And this is quite simply because anything that involves something that people touch, especially gyms, they're just a hive of freaking germs anyway. Oh my goodness, like the whole idea of um, you know, picking up a, a weights that the last person didn't wipe down or, or sanitize is just disgusting. So you probably find that gyms are gonna find it really difficult to see those those everyday kind of people, not, not the, the hardcore fitness fanatics and those who work out morning, noon and night. We're just going to see the, the kind of people who, like myself, need to lose some weight, but we're not necessarily gym people, but we'd be more happy to work out stores with, with a guide. That will start to increase. There's some good news, I think, in there for personal trainers who were some of the best people to, I guess, use, to use an overused word, pivot, um, they were able to pivot during COVID-19 and do a lot of online training through um, through you know, webcams and, and phone cameras and that sort of thing. Entertainment-wise, the movie cinemas are going to fail to attract crowds because simply so many movies are being delayed until next year. There's so few movies scheduled to come out for the rest of this year that the movie cinemas, even where I am in Darwin, they're allowed to open now, but they're just not. They're just staying closed because there's nothing to show. So things like that, bowling, trampolines, anything where you've got to touch things that lots of other people are touching or have touched, anything into equipment, that's going to be really slow to recover. Um, but things like computer games, streaming TV, um, online learning platforms, they'll steadily increase as we now understand it a lot better. If COVID's taught us one thing, it's that all these things we thought we couldn't do, like work from home, um, conduct our meetings via Zoom, all those things we thought we would never be able to cope with, we amazingly coped with and quite well to the point where um, Zoom has become you know, a household word. It's what we do with schools, the kids who can't get to school now. We're looking at alternatives now for when kids are sick at home, they can still even participate in the classroom um, via Zoom. There's, there's a whole lot of movements going towards that. So yeah, as we now know, we can do a lot more things online. We are doing a lot more things online, which brings us to food and beverage. Dining in, well, it'll be better during the lockdown and be better than what was during the lockdown, I mean. Those usual peak periods that we know of when people are in, in dining, in holiday mode, that kind of thing, they will continue to be lower than previous years. That is gonna take quite a while to respond as we get kind of get used to having to deal with waiters behind barriers, um, lack of table service, and instead of table service having, you know, go and order from the counter and then sit down and have it brought out to you. Things like social drinking at the pub um, and nightclubs and that, they're, they're going to suffer a little bit because we've learned how to do these things at home now. We've learned how to entertain at home. We've got great big TVs that allow us to view the sports events in the way that we want to, with the food we want to serve, and with the people we want to invite. We don't have to share the pub with 50 other people we don't like. Um, so that whole thing of you know, spending the afternoon at the pub to watch the races or the afternoon at the pub to watch the footy is going to die off quite a lot because so much of the things we do that are entertaining now, we can do at home. I don't like to see pubs suffer. The other thing, one thing that might get people back in is a bit of entertainment. Where we just want to go and see a band or we want to go and see a comedy show, things that we can't necessarily do quite as easily from home or there are more of a unique experience. Things like organic fresh, vegan, all those subcategories of food are slumping to their lowest levels in probably in a decade. Um, we, we actually see it quite often when uh, the supermarkets were getting cleaned out of food. There was just like this one area of meat, this one area of, um, of, of sort of deli things. There was the vegan area that was still full of all its products. That showed us really that um, those of us who would normally go, I'm going to try that and I'm going to maybe adopt a more vegan lifestyle, um, for no reason apart from they, they, they want to try it, well, then those people just won't exist just for a while. The interest in things like a natural, healthy, and all that, it, it's already crashed during COVID-19, and some of those subcategories just won't recover anytime soon. There'll be a very, very slow return to some of those things as we send, tend to, in hard times, return to the things we know and love and trust rather than trying new things. Um, right now, it's all about price. So if you can get something cheaper, you will get it cheaper. If you want it, so it's easy to get, you, it's, if it's delivered, anything like that, those are the areas where you'll start to see taking a bit of a rise. But things where they are very, very specialty product in a specialty section um, next to things that are literally a quarter of the price, they will suffer a great deal. Network marketing is an interesting one because this is covering all your, um, all your multi-level marketing, your yeah, Amways, or less Amway these days, maybe like the, the Lavelles and It Works and, um, 
isogenics and all those kind of guys. Um, in the well-being space, and this is really bad for a lot of the, the powder potion and pill um, network marketing schemes, I'd say that that's going to slump for the next 12 months. It's not going to recover very quickly at all because the economic conditions simply don't support the idea that you'll pay a premium amount of money for something which you can basically buy from any health food store on the, on the, on the supermarket shelves. Things like protein powders, um, things like health supplements, vitamins and all that are simply just collapsing because they're some of the first things we stop buying because they're so expensive. But when you're paying an extra premium to be in a scheme of this, well, yeah, that's, that's going to be one of the first things that's going to crash. And we've already seen that. Um, I've, I've got friends in network marketing programs and they're really suffering right now, particularly those who are quite reliant upon it for their, for their primary income. Party plans like your Tupperwares, your um, undercover wares, all those ones. Um, but there are still sustained concerns for people about gathering in groups of people they don't know. And party plans quite often bring you in contact with people that you don't know. They're friends of a friend that you don't really know how they live or you don't feel like you really want to sit in a very small lounge room next to them on a couch. So we're going to see that remain in very negative territory for the foreseeable future. We can't really see a great deal of, of recovery for that one for a while. Not until we start to see the unemployment levels drop. Um, and that's probably not till sort of mid 2021. Interesting working from home will increase. That's one area that a network marketing can sort of focus on. So if you're in a network marketing program at the moment, this could be a really good one for you to focus on. Not so much on the, you know, get the lifestyle of your dreams and you can, you too can live on a yacht and travel the world and work from anywhere. But concentrating on that, um, meeting people where they're really at going, okay, there's uncertainty in the job market. Wouldn't be great if you could sort of offset that with a little extra um, income at home rather than that sort of like those great big, huge, massive um, statements of, you know, you earn six figures in 30 days and all that kind of stuff we got quite often see those friends of ours who jump from scheme to scheme always saying there will be a lot of interest in the working from home movement as it already has been but there's going to be significantly less who are interested in less of working in network marketing from home it's going to lead more to people going and doing um things that they can do that they already do that they can do in their spare time um through whether it's uber driving or it's going to be something like um you know, being an ironing service. So after hours, making a few extra dollars by ironing the neighbor's clothes. A lot of that gig economy kind of work is going to be quite big. So not so much network marketing, but you know, there is an opportunity there to, I guess, if you're promoting a network marketing product to use the work from home angle rather than the make six figures in 30 days. Not that anyone believes that anyway. Events. Well, you people have absolutely been hammered. I know. It's just been absolute bloodbath when it comes to events. So many have been canceled, not much going on. There will be a small drop in the online event area. So if you've been converting over to doing a lot of online events, a lot of long online seminars, conferences, that kind of thing, is it will drop back off a little bit, but it'll still remain really, really vital as we're not as scared of online events as we were. We didn't think our attention span could handle it. it turns out we're not too bad at that. We're quite good at doing a lot of learning and seminars. And in fact, look at you on a Saturday afternoon, five of you are sitting in here learning about stuff that you normally would probably not do on a Saturday afternoon. So, you know, we've changed a lot when it comes to online events, but when it comes to conferences, those big conferences, I don't know if you've ever been to any, I used to go to two, three, four a year. Um, I'm probably never going to go to another conference again. There's nothing I can get from a conference. That I can't get from online delivered versions of those conferences. And it may never, ever recover the same level it used to be. There's just so much cost involved, not only in the people organizing it, but the people attending. It'll cost you $1,000 to get a ticket. Then it's going to cost you another $1,000 in accommodation and flights and, and eating while you're away. And the fact that you're just crammed in a room of 5,000 other people and they're coughing and they're spluttering and their lack of social distancing, you, you don't know what you're going to come home with. And we always have to call it conference flu when we go anywhere. You come home and then the week after you come home from that event, you'd be sick. And it, it was almost like a, it, we, we just used to call it conference flu because it was this flu that just seemed magically straight after you're in a room with 5,000 other people. We reckon we're going to see 50% of these kind of conferences never come back. And that's going to be a massive hit to that industry because there's a whole industry that's just so reliant upon those big events. 
But those small networking groups, small networking nights and um, smaller, you know, uh, industry kind of nights, they're probably the first ones that are going to recover because they're always the first ones to recover because there's so many of them and they're so small and they're cheap to run, cheap to attend, and they're not really like a massive undertaking. Unfortunately, not really the kind of ones that event organizers do the organizing for. This is generally what people organize themselves. So that might be an area where um, the usual event organizers who are used to doing, you know, 10, 40, $50,000 events um, may need to sort of pivot to an area where they can handle a lot of these smaller events and a lot more of them. So a lot of those small networking functions I've noticed are starting to, um, I've been to like three in the last week that have started to already rebound and happen in person. And we will continue to see that on the rise, though it will stay a little lower than last year. Some of those um, smaller ones actually probably won't come back as well. Um, they'll probably just rest them for a while until the, the economic circumstances can support it, I guess. And people are a lot more willing to head outside the front door. So as we start to look now at beyond all that information, there's so much of it in there. What do we do with all that? And the first thing we'd say we need to do is we need to assess where our business is at, look at the information that's coming in and do even more. Don't just trust my information. Um, I get it from my various um, sources, but there's more information out there that may be relevant to your particular industry. Take that information aside, what are you gonna do with it? Some people are just gonna simply say, I need to shut down this business. There is no way I'm gonna make money off this for the foreseeable future. I'll just be wasting my time, wasting my money, it's not gonna happen. But there's also the option of pivoting a bit. And that's the idea where you say, okay, I'm doing this particular business, but I've probably been aiming at the wrong kind of person with a very small amount of change. I could probably hit this bit of money that's over there by doing much the same as I'm doing now, but just positioning it slightly different or producing it slightly differently. So for instance, if you were making, um, an example would be if you used to make handmade um, kids clothes, that could very easily convert to handmade face masks, handmade anything that sort of comes as something that's um, becoming more popular again. So it could be something where people are doing a lot more cleaning of their houses. So instead of buying Chuck super wipes from the supermarket, you can have, okay, here's a product I'm making, which is from, um, from a particular source of textiles that I'm picking up from indigenous designers in Arnhem Land. Or it could be that this is uh, from uh, offcuts from my local fabric store that have been around for 40 years and I want to, I want to support them by producing wiping cloths and, and, and toweling stuff that's going to be a little bit different to what you'd normally do, but is related to what you normally do. Or you can just continue as is. If you feel like you've actually done COVID really well, you've survived it really well, your plan could be to say, okay, I've done my assessment. I've looked at what the industry is doing. I've looked at what the economy is doing. I'm looking at all these trends and, and where, where people are heading towards, what consumers are starting to do. And I'm pretty confident that I can continue exactly as is. Um, I just may need to then decide on the next level, which is number two, what your plans for the next 12 months of marketing are. So if you were going to stay as is, you may then need to make a decision whether you speed up your marketing a bit more, whether you start putting a bit more time and money into it, whether you slow it down. Um, if you're already not doing much, that may be then not doing anything. If you think I need to sort of hold my ground for a little while and just not do anything, um, not even produce anything, just try and clear out my excess stock for now. Or you might stay again as is, do the same level of marketing you've been doing, the same $10 a day Facebook ads campaign you've been running for the last 12 months. Just bear in mind that there are trends that will continue to emerge when it comes to marketing. So whilst I said that, you know, revenue has collapsed in radio and TV stations lately, um, and I know this because I'm getting my TV and radio ads a lot cheaper than I used to. It's been quite a good thing for me. That said, um, that may not stay the same. That may start to then fill up with cheaper advertisers. Then you find next, we have to then pay a bit more for that. So based on all that stuff you're going to do, whether you're going to speed up or slow down your business, whether you're going to pivot to something else or whether you're going to stay exactly as is, your plan for that next 12 months of marketing has to bear that in mind. And it can't just be one plan that sits there concrete. It's not like Moses with the tablets with the 10 commandments on it. 
this has to be something which is more like a, you know, writing on a tablet where you can write on it and then you can delete it and start and write something else or make some changes along the way. We are predicting certain things are gonna happen, absolutely. Whether those things definitely happen, that's another thing. We don't know what the result of removing the JobKeeper payments is going to be to small businesses and big businesses across Australia. We don't know whether the, excuse me, oh, that's better. We don't know whether um, the, the resurrected Virgin Australian Airline is going to have an impact that's actually broad enough to affect our economy, whether it's going to hold back tourism or bring it forward a bit more. So there's certain things we don't know, but there's things we definitely can plan for. So I think that in the case of where you've come out of your, your COVID-19 experience quite well, and you haven't been impacted that greatly, then it, it could be probably very tempting to slow down your marketing. I'm not convinced that slowing down your marketing would be a great thing to do right now, specifically if you haven't lost out much during COVID-19. If you've got the kind of product and, and Ray bringing up about the homemade jewelry before, which isn't available in stores, I would say that slowing down your marketing is probably not a wise decision because what you're needing to do is probably find a new market and that will involve you perhaps having to speed up your marketing. I uh, raised this out there as someone that traditionally sells to the public and has mainly sold via physical presence. It sounds like trying to prove that online sales would be a sensible use of my time as well as stressing the gift angle. Absolutely. Because the first place we used to look for, for gifts used to be the local shopping center or the local, not really in the local market, more so the local Westfield shopping town, really. You go in there, you look for something, be inspired by what you saw and buy or not buy. These days, our first line of inspiration is Google. We're looking for, we'll, we'll quite literally say, hey, G, what's a great gift for a 13-year-old girl? And it'll bring us back a whole lot of options. We go, oh, that's a, actually homemade jewelry. That'd be something really interesting. So that means like sort of having to be very present online, um, being able to have an online store and doing it at the lowest possible price you can possibly do it at. Because I can imagine that handmade jewelry is not selling, is not making you a multimillionaire right now. Um, it might be wrong, could be. Um, but in the case where it's not, well, then you'll have to look at going perhaps to build the cheapest online store you possibly can do on your own, but saving most of your budget for the marketing of that and doing a lot of research on, um, <laughs> you're not a millionaire, thanks, Ray. <laughs> Neither am I, mate, it's okay. Um, the, if you're looking at uh, a lot of the online uh, courses that teach you how to do a Shopify store and marketing on things like Instagram, learning how to become an Instagram um, shopping whiz may be a really great place for you. Um, even though Instagram is really an impulse shopping paradise rather than a, a planned shopping paradise, I think um, there's, there's room for you definitely there to speed up your marketing, but make sure you've got somewhere to send people because sending them to a physical online on front, like a front shop, a shop front or a market stall is probably not going to be that effective when people are just not going to those things. You need to be able to meet them where they're at in order to make it much easier for them to make that decision or at least to find you. And then finally, when we go, we execute our marketing plan, which is about forming and, and perhaps changing a lot of what we call our promise. So our promise is what we want to deliver. I will deliver the finest quality homemade jewelry um, for women who like to um, look different and have a unique piece um, of their, a, a unique personality piece on them. So forming what that promise is. Now your promise might be that, or it might be the lowest cost alternative to buying a unique gift for your friend. Those are kind of like what we used to call positioning statements a lot in marketing, where you put together like an idea that people could get behind, something they could believe in. Then there's the offer. What are you actually offering? Is that offer going to be um, free delivery when you order over $100 worth of, of jewelry? Or could it be, um, your offer could be, if you don't like it, send it back and we'll give you something else. Or send it back and you'll get a store credit to buy something else. So whatever the offer is that, that is a little bit more unique to you than what it is to everybody else. And then what the value proposition is, that's usually what the pricing is. So how much are you gonna charge for this thing? Um, what, why is that a valuable thing to have at that price compared to going to clients and buying a piece of jewelry off the shelf from there? 
also what your availability is. There's no use putting a really low price thing, spending a lot of money on marketing and realizing that um, you've only got three of those things to sell and you've just um, sold 30 of them online and you very, very suddenly need to produce another you know, 27 of them. Knowing that if you've got a low availability, then perhaps you need to slow down the marketing on that particular item and gear it more towards the things that you don't have um, a limited amount of. And then finally, the voice of what your brand's going to be. So this is when we're looking at, you know, how does your brand present itself? Are you young and flirty? Are you um, more staid and sensible? Is it a fun, colorful feel to everything you do? Or is it more, you know, the, the, the navy blue trust factor? Um, that executing of the plan is probably the very end thing to be doing simply because you've got these things at the top that assessing where your business is and being really, really honest about it, as well as then making a decision based on where you're at, matching that again with the state of the economy, the state of how people are shopping and the, and the trends that you're able to do some research on. Doing that first before, and, and it's very, very tempting just to jump straight to the execution going, yes, I want to write this down and put this in a document and show this to the world and get my Facebook ads going. You really need to step back a few steps and just make sure you do a very, very honest assessment of where you are at. What's the truth of where you're at? Because in a lot of cases, it may be time to shut down that business and start something new, or it may be time to considerably change the state of your business, what it is you're selling, what your value proposition is, what the goals of your business are. Do you need to reduce it to a side gig while you go off and do a full-time job that helps you to pay for the bills? Um, that's something which you know, even I had to do at one point during the building of my business was I had to go, I need to slow down this business. It's growing too fast for me and I can't keep up. I need to go and get a full-time job so I can afford to hire someone else to work in my business. So there's sometimes those decisions you have to make well in advance of getting the point of planning what you're going to do with your marketing or executing that plan for your marketing. So when it comes to forming that plan, that's when you're going to get to the point where you're going to go, okay, it's time to talk to someone who knows about this sort of stuff, who really understands what they're doing with it. Um, I'm not saying call me because I'm probably a little bit too busy to be doing individual marketing plans right now, but there's plenty of people out there who can and lots and lots of resources that are available online to help you to build that marketing plan all of your own. Um, you can just search. There's an excellent marketing plan template actually from um, the Department of Business in Victoria. So if you search for Victoria uh, marketing plan template, on, on Google, that's a really good one. I'm specifically pointing that out because I've used that a number of times to form the basis of marketing plans that I've written for clients. And it's been a really good way of thinking out everything you need to think out, including looking at the research you can find out about consumer patterns right now. So definitely look for some of those items. Um, just type in consumer patterns 2020 and you'll be able to see how people are shopping. Some of the, um, the, the, the information that's coming back from the retail traders associations and those kind of movements telling you what people are liking, what people are not liking, how to tell what trends are moving in your direction and whether there's certain things that you should just look at and go, hmm, maybe that's a product I need to drop for now. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just dropping my email address into the chat window um, just to let you know that you can contact me through that email address if you want to ask any questions about what was in this particular presentation. In addition, this presentation will be available through YouTube at Business Station. So if you go to YouTube, you can go to Business, uh, search for Business Station. There's a whole range of this C19 Biz Booster series, which is on there and available will be viewed for free. That's um, the same with all these, this series, you can see them for free. Probably taking probably about Tuesday or Wednesday before this particular one will be on there. In the meantime, have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for spending part of your weekend with me. And hopefully um, your business is able to not just survive, but thrive as we come back out of the rebound from COVID-19. Thank you and have a great day.